Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MS Pitts. It's Ukraine War Update Extra video giving you extra tidbits and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. Why am I a little bit chipper? Well I've got a good cup of tea that's always a good start. It's also and this is particularly for my Australian and English viewers, uh, English and Welsh viewers technically. Uh, so it is the fifth day of the first Ashes test. This is cricket we're talking about. I have a bottle of wine later tonight. Uh, it's ready. It's an all-out uh, Australian Merlot. It's all-out WG Grace, the kind of founder of cricket there. I was going to get into that later today because obviously England are going to win the first Ashes test. But we've had thunderstorms all night and there was, is it going to be rained off? Fifth day, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. It's one twenty, and I haven't even had time to look yet. Anyway, uh, just to let... The Australians here know that, uh, yeah, good luck with that one. We're going to have you, if not today, then over the whole series. Right. Anyway, most of you won't give a damn about cricket. So uh, we'll get on and talk about uh, thermal optics in uh, N2A2 Bradleys, because, of course, that's the alternate to a cricket conversation. Right. Ukrainian M2A2 Bradley firing at Russian positions using the night vision mode was feared by Russian troops and they have all the reason to. This is footage from the Zaporizhia front. Let's have a little, little look at this first before uh, going to Ukraine, the latest podcast. So those guys blow up something, some bit of uh, equipment with the use of the the auto cannon, whatever it is, on the front of the N two O two Bradley, and using thermal optics. Now there is a huge range of these to be used uh, technologically over time. They've evolved, and there is many who say that the Ukrainians have an asymmetrical. Uh, an asymmetry here with a real advantage with regard to night operations being able to see at night much more easily given the equipment that they've been given by their allies uh, some have denied some russian voices in my throat have denied this saying absolute rubbish but it seems to be generally accepted that that this is the case and that's why a lot of ukrainian activity on the zaporizhia front line is taking place at night uh, not only that but you can see things like uh, mines as uh, the summer days things cool at different rates when you get to nighttime and metal will cool at a different rate to earth and so therefore actually it's easier to see things like mines with thermal optics uh Im imaging so here is ukraine the latest podcast this is hamish de breton gordon speaking with dom nichols both former uh, tank crew i believe um uh talking about thermal optics here stardom now hamish how do tanks see at night i i don't they they haven't got huge great goggles on the front so how do you fight at night from a tank I heard your description earlier on in the week, or was it? Yeah, it was on Monday, I think, and and pretty good, Dom. I can't remember if you were if it was just Challenger One that you were um, you you operated on, or Challenger Two as well. Chieftain was well. wasn't <laughs> Chieftain. even Challenger One, mate. It was Chieftain. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So I, I think back first of all, how tanks operate at night is through their 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 predominantly thermal sights, night vision sights, and using GPS and also using their lasers to gauge distances. And I'll just, just come back to that. My memories of the first Gulf War, where we had Challenger 1, we had a very sort of early stage of thermal sights, but it still worked incredibly well. What we didn't have, though, was GPS. Now, at night, what the, the most challenging thing is knowing exactly where you are. And in the first Gulf War, we had one GPS per squadron, so one GPS for every 14 tanks. Now, everybody has them. They probably have several. Uh, and knowing where you are is, is absolutely crucial. I can only really comment on Challenger 2. I, have, I haven't seen a Leopard 2 night sight as well, and they're of similar capability. These are very reliable and basically 
they turn night into day. There are various different settings that you can use and they are not tunnel visioned. When, when you were a chopper pilot flying around with night vision goggles on, not that I've ever done it. I, I forget, actually, Dom Nichols was a helicopter pilot. I, uh, I was like, is he, oh, I think he's a helicopter pilot. Yeah, he was a, who has been in tanks, uh, but in a chieftain tank, as he said. Uh, there are some claims about, you know, some night vision uh, pieces of equipment are actually quite difficult to get used to using because they are like tunnel vision rather than all around. So it depends what you're doing. If you're like uh, uh, wearing a pair of goggles and you have a different experience to driving a tank and some things are actually quite diff difficult to get used to and you don't have the full peripheral vision and so on and so forth. So it is, it, it is very dependent on the, on the, on the equipment being used, of course. Uh, right. So let's continue. I understand you have quite a, a sort of narrow field of view with a challenger two night sight actually you've got a very wide field of view which you can then focus in on i can't remember the times magnification but 20 or 50 or whatever it is so with that you don't not only use that for finding and attacking targets but also for navigation so it it takes quite a lot of training it takes time to get to to know how to to use it properly and the confidence but it does. I mean, I, I remember my when I was second in command of the Second Royal Tank Regiment, we spent four, no, no probably about eight weeks in, in Canada and Batis training, only operating at night. And I must say, after a couple of weeks, it made no difference whether you're at night or day. And if that's the case, if you are fighting an enemy that, that cannot see at night, you have a great advantage. And I think this is really important as well. So spent eight weeks in Canada only operating at night. This is the importance of training, like training, training, training. Now, the Ukrainians haven't had the luxury of, of yes, they have had training, but they're not out of war time. They're, they're, you know, that it, at, at involved in a war, go off and do some training, but you've got to get back pretty quick because we need, we need to use you. Whereas the British Army at that time would be like, right, okay, we're not at war. Uh, so you've got over this year, you're going to have eight weeks doing night night vision training there. You're going to do your firing there. You're going to do this there, so on and so forth. Uh, it would be a, a great luxury for the Ukrainian uh, combat crews to have the, the these tank crews to have, say, eight weeks training on just night vision, but they're not going to get that. They're going to be doing a lot of uh, learning on the job, which obviously isn't as ideal, but, you know, you, you do what you've got to do. I think I mentioned it in Roland's piece yesterday that there is, if you cannot see at night and somebody is attacking you or there are tanks and armoured vehicles around, it's petrifying. It's incredibly disorientating. So that is the, 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 the basis. And the other thing about combining the thermal sights, the laser, a laser, basically a tank has a laser to work out what the ranges are. And you can then compute that into a grid reference which you can then pass back to your artillery so they can support you as well. And against somebody who can't see at night, it is also slightly, and I, I sort of caveat this with various situations, it's slightly easier sometimes to pick out mines at night through a thermal site that, than it is in the day. Difference in temperature, cooling down the temperature, mines tend to be metal or, or, or have a metal content. Therefore, they cool down at different rates to, the, to, to the, the soil around them. So it's something with training, you can operate as though it's daytime. And if you're fighting somebody who can't, then you have a significant, significant advantage. Over. Thanks, Hamish. And um, just... Yeah, so I, I think that's hugely important. And the, the fact that, or well, the claim is that Ukrainians have lots of this equipment or lots more of this equipment than the than the Russians means that they have a real advantage. Yes, they don't have uh, close air support, right? So what can they do to counteract the advantage that you, the Russians have there or use their advantage in being able to see at night? So I would imagine there'll be, uh, as seems to be the claims, an awful lot more Ukrainian uh, attacking manoeuvres taking place at night than in the daytime. Okay, here's a comment from Clayton McGee. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you very much for the uh, super thanks as well. Uh, Jonathan, I was quite vocal about my feelings on this counteroffensive during the first handful of conflicts uh, in 
its first waves. However, Ukrainian High Command immediately began implementing solutions where it could and adjusted its strategy to accommodate the challenges it faced. So this is the idea that, you know, that, that Orokiv offensive that we saw, those those Leopards and Bradleys, and that was filmed from like 82 different angles, and the Russians were going, yay, 82 times. And that was like, oh, everyone's like, oh, no, this is not going so well. But you're going to come across instances like this. I mean, the expectation, we've got to adjust our expectations to be more in line with reality. The Russians are going to provide some really stiff opposition. They have been digging in for months and months and months. They've dug their trenches. They are ready as much as they could be, given that they have a lack of trained troops. Uh, but they've got some fairly decent troops in some of these areas. Uh, they are going to be ready for the counteroffensive, and the Ukrainians are going to be up against it, given that they don't have air advantage they don't have air superiority they don't have air supremacy so you know they it's going to be challenging so given that there are going to be these periods or, or events where things don't go right for whatever reason the question is do the ukrainians learn from that do they adjust and it seems like they've adjusted so for example seeing all those leopards uh, and bradley's taken out have we seen uh, such losses again no we haven't have we seen a lot more light infantry uh, attacks using light vehicles dropping off the infantry and then the mechanized equipment skedaddling yes with the support of artillery precision artillery uh, does that mean that we're seeing you know fewer instances of masses of equipment being lost by the ukrainians arguably yes although they are still going to obviously lose equipment it's not like they they're not going to use equipment at all but we seem to be seeing a lot more apcs uh, and mraps being lost um so that's armor personnel carriers and mine resistant ambush protection vehicles which are these uh, heavy four by fours, but they're they're not your tanks or or infantry fighting vehicles, and they they are getting lost as they're delivering troops. But importantly, they are they, they might lose these vehicles, but they're not losing so many uh, so many troops. And this is something that the Estonian uh, head of intelligence, Colonel uh, Margot Grosberg, I think, was saying that actually uh, we won't see any full scale major offensive operation in the next seven days and we're also seeing that most uh, ukrainians that are getting uh, their vehicles taken out are surviving and that is really important where that's not necessarily the case with the russians using older equipment uh, so anyway sorry i interrupted clayton and his fantastic comment here so slow or gradual is not a characterization that should ever be attributed to this operation the sheer volume and pace of assault vectors along the whole of the 600 mile front line contradicts slow or gradual in the flurry of assault vectors defenders are being dislodged incessantly from their positions when they win them back every time they're dislodged they're forced to give up ground this is cumulative and strategically sound on ukraine's part literally every conflict zone is heavily embattled and not only are defenders anchored to their respective defense zones but reserves and mobile secondary reinforcements are heavily taxed i guess the idea is like what what do you mean by slow it's not like things aren't happening things are happening but advances are slow given all of the defenses that are put in place and the resistant the russians resistance that the russians are obviously uh, giving um, ukraine is on the right track he says however this doesn't negate the extremely terrible level of losses that they are incurring your morning reports tell the tale the amount of hardware and special kit ukraine is taking out doesn't fit with the number of personnel we're accustomed to seeing accompany it my best guess is that the ukrainian losses have to be at least twice that of the federation forces but i don't believe that's in vain so he's actually saying that ukrainians are losing more than the russians uh but that's that's kind of not in vain that's what you'd expect there's some claims that that offensive forces sh should expect to lose up to 40 percent of their forces uh, equipment troops you can slice and dice that however you like uh, i don't i doubt they're losing that that much which means it may be sort of a cautious use of their equipment now uh but again that that 40 percent losses would not accord with our expectations because most of us have unrealistic expectations and we have our desires at play which is we, we, it's a wishful thinking fallacy we really want this to be true that they're just going to blast through the russian defenses and have some kind of magically successful uh counter offensive but that's simply not going to be the case and just wanting it to be the case doesn't make it the case um so at some point 
the breaks will come and I believe there will be multiple breaks. Russia is fully deployed and almost completely engaged literally everywhere. Once it breaks, I believe it all crumbles. It, it is difficult, though, seeing the real human toll, toll in order to see this through. So he's saying that, look, it will cost a lot of men to overcome these defences in multiple places, a lot of men and equipment, and we should expect to see those losses for the Ukrainians. But that is part of the course. And once you get that break, that will be at the sacrifice of those people. I mean, goodness me, who would want to be in the vanguard? You know, oh yeah, you guys, you you're the guys that's going. You're going to go in and find the weakness. So what? It's not not those guys. There, it's, it's me. I'm I'm having to do that. I'm having to go go through with this and be the one who's most likely to die in this whole conflict while they're just waiting for us to make the break and then they'll charge in with their Challenger twos and leopards. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's you. Okay. Thanks, Gov. So that's a really tough call, and that talks to the bravery of these people, the courage of the people who are in the vanguard doing this really difficult work where you have the higher probability of of basically uh, you know, being a casualty. Uh, perhaps acknowledging their sacrifice. In fact, this is, look, I, I hadn't read this ahead. I obviously read this the other day, but this is exactly, I think, what he's going to say. Perhaps acknowledging their sacrifice with accurate depi depictions of cumulative temporary gains, like dislodged, pushed back, pushed back, occupied enemy positions and the like, would help paint a more appropriate picture of the successes they they are making, even in temporary exchanges of territory. And I think that's it. A absolutely brilliant comment there to, about you know, rejigging our expectations if they were off. And if they weren't off, then, you know, well done. But it's easy to to have come into this whole counteroffensive thinking that it was all going to be much more, much easier than it actually is. And, and reality bites. Uh, but yeah, I, I personally think, I, I mean, I asked, and now might be a good time to share this. I asked my members on the channel whether they think uh, it is all going to plan or not in a poll. Let's have a look at the data. So my question, and this has been answered by, oh, I'm not sure how many, oh, 78 people. So team members, this is completely subjective, obvs. Uh, from a pro-Ukrainian point of view, how do you think the counteroffensive has gone so far? Worse than expected, 12%. Uh, better than expected, 1%. As expected, 74%. I'm all, all over the shop on this one. Gah! Uh, 13%. Uh, I would be probably the last one with actually possibly in as expected once I've readjusted my expectations. But I was kind of realistic. I, I, did, I was saying this is going to be more difficult than people think. And I have been talking about defences quite a lot. Uh, but I, I really also appreciate what um, Clayton says here in that possibly once they are overrun they will crumble that i think the the russians are using their reserves they are quite thinly uh populating these defensive lines and fortifications and once once the breaks are made it might well be a different picture but so i guess as expected with a little element of like ah like today, there's not a lot of information coming out. Things are looking quite slow. But then they aren't using that many for you know many brigades here in in this counteroffensive at the moment. In these early stages, they're just sounding out the the landscape. Right, moving on to something different. Uh, I know this is boring for many people, but Elon Musk again. But actually, he's, we're going to talk about someone who's pretty pretty interesting, uh, not in a good way. So Russia says Michael McKay, Russian asset Elon Musk, has returned the notorious war criminal Graham Phillips to Twitter. I started writing about Phillips. He's the 21st century's Lord Haw in 2015. Note, at that time, Plotnitsky was the figurehead of the LPR faction of the Russian terrorist state. So basically, the LPR, Luhansk People's Republic, uh, and this is Michael McKay is going back to 2015. Graham Phillips, hate propagandist and participant in war crimes against Ukrainian POWs, receives a medal from Russian terrorist Plotnitsky. Nitsky, uh, whatever. So, um, Graham Phillips, well, who is he? Uh, just to, to add to this, 
Uh, Graham Phillips says Michael Weiss, who's a really good journalist, uh, does a lot of work for Yahoo News and other outlets, newly returned to Elon Musk's Twitter, would have you believe he's a journalist, scare quotes, unfairly sanctioned by the UK. Not so. Phillips staged an interrogation of a Ukrainian soldier, Ivan Isik, who was horribly burned by Russian neo-Nazis of Rusik. Uh, see this thread. And yeah, this was a pretty horrible thing. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Uh, this piece here, actually, well, let's uh, read it, I guess, and then we'll we'll go to the Wikipedia. But Rusik first gained attention following the publication of a video filmed in the aftermath of an ambush of, on a Ukrainian convoy near the Luhansk village of Metalist in September 2014. The footage shows members of the unit in combat interrogating an injured Ukrainian service member. His captors had carved a Kolov rat into his cheek. Five days after the ambush, Graham Phillips, a now sanctioned British pro Russian propagandist, filmed an quote, it's gay quotes, interview with a service member who was unrecognizably burned from head to toe. I think he had 70% burns. Uh, evidently, Rusik had doused him with fuel and set him alight after taking him prisoner. Speaking in 2019 to the Belarusian independent TV channel Belsat, the victim's parents confirmed that the man in both videos was their son, Ivan Isik. According to the Belsat documentary, armed men abducted Isik from a hospital in occupied Luhansk several days after the, quote, interview with Phillips. They killed him. Isik's body was returned to the family the following month. His father reported that Isik's internal organs had been cut out and replaced in his body and blue and yellow fabric had been stuffed into his mouth. So Graham Phillips, who's been returned to, to Musk's Twitter by Elon Musk, again, what's this signaling? So I keep saying that Elon Musk is doing everything to show the world that he's that he is pro-Russian. And then he goes and does something else that shows you the same thing. And like, whether you like him or not, if you're pro-Ukrainian, Elon Musk is not really your number one, shouldn't really be your number one guy. So you might really appreciate him for what he's done with Tesla, um, for what his intentions might have been for, for Twitter, if that's your thing. I mean, I disagree, but whatever you think, he is parroting pro-Russian propaganda continuously and making decisions that favor the pro-Russian narrative, the, the Kremlin narrative. And he's just, that's what he's doing. And here's another example. Anyway, so he's allowed Graham Phillips back on to Twitter. So Phillips has been accused of being pro-Russian, lending faux legitimacy to the Kremlin propaganda and Russian conspiracy theories with his middle-class English accent. Phillips himself maintains his reporting is independent journalism. He's been awarded several medals for his work. Oh, that's good. Who by? From the separatist republics of Donbass and organizations in Russia. Oh, okay. So basically, he used to work for RT, which is state propaganda, uh, and then he's gone through working for different Russian media outlets. Uh, what the, that event was referring to is reported here in Wikipedia in September 2014. He filmed an interview with Ivan Isik, a member of the Ukrainian Adar Battalion. Isik had been captured and reportedly set on fire by the Russian neo-Nazi Rusik group with over 70% of his body covered in burns. Phillips then interviewed him as he lay in hospital. In 2019, his parents were reported as seeking international condemnation of Phillips for breaking journalistic ethics. Several days after the interview, Isik was reportedly abducted from the hospital and killed. You know, uh, I'm interviewing him, he's in this hospital and then later oh he's been abducted and killed as a result of your interview yeah it looks like it and it just his this wikipedia page is is quite fascinating read by the way if you want to spend some time looking at a wiki page today's a good day to look at graham phillips he's got a very interesting and by interesting i mean not a good uh life history in terms of his career, like basically old, uh, working for the Russians, uh, doing pro-Russian things and going across Europe and actually doing pro-Brexit things, but uh, possibly on behalf of the Russians, um, going to Donbass, uh, you know, attacking um, or verbally attacking, what was it, a Ukrainian, disabled Ukrainian POWs that didn't get him in uh, in the good books with the with the Ukrainians and so on and so forth. He's just then he interviewed Aidan Aslin, got into trouble. He's basically been sanctioned, fully sanctioned. So in July 2022, Phillips became the only British-born citizen to date to be sanctioned by his own country. So he's been sanctioned and then he's allowed back on Twitter, which, you know, it's kind of like under, undermines the sanctioning of uh, the UK sanctioning anyway Phillips responded I don't have any opportunity to defend myself no one notified me there are no real charges against me Phillips immediately launched an appeal against his sanctions calling them ridiculous 
illegal and dangerous. Uh, but he remains under sanctions and he reports, continues to report from the Donbass. Uh, there are just honestly so many uh, like interesting. I mean, Ukrainians did a petition to get his passport revoked. I mean, he's really not uh, not a popular guy in Ukraine. He's basically a Russian um, uh, propagandist. He's a he's a Russian asset really is uh, and yeah go and check out all, all, all this stuff on the wikipedia page um so yeah is is this a case of elon musk making a decision that's to the benefit of the, of the russians yes absolutely 100 percent. this only benefits the russians that decision so yeah okay russian army hit by cholera outbreak after the kokovka dam flooding and there's uh, little hint maybe even at odessa uh, there's cholera outbreak there as well which is in the Ukrainian non-occupied uh, territories. The Russian army has been hit by a cholera outbreak days after the destruction of the Novokokovka Dam in southern Ukraine causing uh, that caused catastrophic flooding, a military partisan movement has said. Attach, a military movement of Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars, which has 41,000 subscribers on Telegram, cited informants from military hospitals in the Kherson region and Crimea as saying that many Russian soldiers are being admitted daily with suspected cases of cholera, a potentially deadly bacterial disease. Several Russian troops have died, the group has said. The reports come after the Soviet era dam part of the Kharkovka hydroelectric power station in southern Ukraine on the Dnipro River was breached in the early hours of June 6, unleashing water on swaths of land as a long-anticipated Ukrainian counteroffensive to take back the seized territories kicked off. Death toll so far is 52, which seems rather low, um, but, you know, that's good that it's low. I mean, long may that be the case. Uh, it's going to be hard to... to know how many people perished you know while the waters are still high in some parts and and houses are yet to be uh, you know looked into so on and so forth so yeah pretty pretty horrible anyway you add waterborne diseases and bacterial diseases like this to it and yeah things things are only going to get worse i guess um so okay to talk about this in a little more uh well, from a different angle, let's look at Trent Zelenko, who's always interested in this kind of stuff. So he talks about a lot about logistics, but also deaths in war that aren't necessary as a result of frontline fighting. So the downstream effects of Russia blowing the Kokovka Dam are now, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, uh, are now starting to eat into the Russian manpower, making the Putin regime's uh, call and pocket defense of southern Ukraine. Um, I'm not quite sure what that means. Waterborne disease has been washed into the Mobix casualty and delusion thread. So every disease associated with bad water is now stalking the Russian army in Kherson and Crimea. Cholera, uh, Escherichia coli, E. coli, uh, dysentery, viral hepatitis and botulism are all stalking the Russian Mobix meat whose sanitation standards are are as non-existent as Russian army logistics. Ouch. Disease is implacable and you cannot cheat it. You can only stop it with sustained sanitation and medical work. The RUAF, the Russian armed forces, are incapable of doing. The Putin regime is now facing the unintended consequences of blowing Kokovka Dam. History has not been kind to armies in Crimea who can't obtain clean water. The British Army of the East lost 16,297 of its 20,813 military deaths in 1854 to 1856 Crimean War. Two waterborne diseases. Wow. And that's you know, where good old um, Florence Nightingale was uh, made famous from. A societal breakdowns follow repeated repeat patterns and Russia drove itself into one in 1999 when they bought into Putinist Russian exceptionalism fantasies and decided that pragmatic realities do not apply to them. Russian exceptionalism is this case in this case being pretending that a lengthy history of flood induced epidemics does not apply to Russians as they are uber mention everything else is just a chain of consequential actions russia had many off ramps along the way but every time decided not to take them and so it has also been with this conflict that's delusional but it's only it isn't the only or all the most important delusion involved here the only reason that putin regime remains in ukraine is because its leadership is convinced 
that if they drag it out long enough that the West w w will cut and run. If the Putin regime thought it could maximise its survival odds by bugging out of Ukraine early, it would. Uh, this bit of utter delusion is a Putin regime faction building an off-ramp just in case. So Kremlin decides the goal to demilitarise Ukraine has largely been achieved. So Peskov talked about this the other day. I didn't actually report this, but I should have done. Peskov said, and you're kind of wondering why he's saying that as a spokesperson for the Kremlin saying, yeah, we've now successfully de uh, denazifies and demilitarize Ukraine. That that goal has been achieved. You're like, really? Uh, yeah. Um, but that that seems like a precursor towards saying, well, now we've done that, we, we can get out. So the only way to really understand why you would say that is if you wanted an off-ramp. Uh, but Putin and his closest Russian oligarch toadies group think that they will be win that they will win by staying, so they persist. There is no independent civic society in Russia. There will be no Russian public uprising against the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian foreign, foreign minister Dmitry Kuleba is right in saying that the Putin regime can lie any which way it wants. And the zombified by 20 years of Russian exceptionalism propaganda, Russian public will nod and agree. There are no good Russians or popular Russian opposition or an oligarch faction we can do a deal with. There never will be. Whoever replaces Putin will be worse than Putin. Yet there is a delusion in DC circles that they can save Russia from itself, which is about as bad a case of delusional hubris that anybody can suffer. The Biden administration de-escalation faction's aim is to turn the Russo-Ukrainian war into a forever war that helps the Russians, the Putin regime. So he's, he's a bit anti-Biden regime, uh, as you can tell here, Trent Tolenko. Uh, I, I don't know that in the Biden regime that de-escalation faction is as prominent now as maybe it might have been earlier on in the war. I think there's a there's a dose of reality that's now there, and that's why these red lines are becoming somewhat less meaningful. Uh, and the US are just giving stuff that they were certainly not wanting to give earlier on in the war. Obviously, there's still ATAC and there's still issues over over airframes, F-16s, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I, I, the the idea as well that there are no good Russians, no popular Russian opposition. I think that's a dangerous thing to say. If you it, as, if you start saying every Russian is evil, then you will put up Rus the Russian hackles so that they will more likely unify behind their leader and their actions, where otherwise they might not have done if you've tried to reach out to them. So there are there will be good Russians, of course. The problem is they have been disenfranchised now for generations, which means there's no effective politics. Actually, so when when you are under, and I talked about this in a previous video, when you're under a Russian or any dictatorship for long enough, you don't know how to do politics. You literally don't know how to get politically engaged because there is no political engagement. You, you, when you get when you or I who live in democracies get politically engaged, we go right. I want this party to get voted in in the next election, so I'm going to go out and campaign for them. I'm going to get online. I'm going to join them. I'm going to join that party. I'm going to do some campaigning. I'm going to talk to my friends. We're going to get out, and I'm going to become politically engaged and active. I become a political activist. But when none of that makes any sense under a, an effective dictatorship, there are no real political parties, or it's all just. Uh, you know, paper politics it doesn't like it maybe there is in there all in all but name or only in name in name only so you say well we could go out and vote but it makes no difference so you become disenfranchised and not politically active and not politically astute not politically engaged not politically knowledgeable uh, and therefore there's there's a kind of zombification if you like politically speaking of people but it doesn't mean that all people are, are evil and bad it's just understanding that that th that's a situation how do you change that from outside well that's really difficult how do you get people engaged enough to have an uprising well if they're not politically engaged and that becomes really difficult for them to get to to kind of break out that mold because there's no kind of will to break out of that mold but because they are they've been disenfranchised over generations uh, and the, the 1990s was a was this golden opportunity to change that and it and it happened in Ukraine and they were successful and that's why Ukraine is a threat to Russia that Putin sees it as because they've done a successful transition to a somewhat functional democracy 
whereas Russia failed and they've gone back to a dictatorship. Uh, they might not claim that they don't claim it is, of course, but it is a dictatorship. Putin is a dictator. You know, if, you, if you're in opposition and you die by falling out of a window being poisoned uh, routinely, then you're not living in a functioning democracy and nothing happens to the people who cause that death, i.e. Putin, and Putin ends up being the richest human being in the world on the back of where? Where's that money coming from? That's a kleptocracy. So he's taking that money through corruption from having his fingers in all of these uh, hydrocarbon pies in in Russia. That is not a functioning, functioning democracy. Every which way you look at Russia, it doesn't have a functioning democracy, and he is a dictator. I don't care what pro-Russian voices say. You haven't got a clue what you're talking about. He is effectively a dictator. And uh, th therefore, changing that becomes so challenging. You know, I don't want to talk about regime change, but obviously everyone wants the regime to change in uh, in U in Russia by its own, you know, by its own will and determination, but that's going to be so difficult to achieve. Uh, and and the, there is a very real chance of Putin being replaced by someone just as just as horrible and ultra nationalist. Those kind of people are lining up. The other kind of people who want to function in democracy end up being dead or in prison. Navalny uh, and those who who have sadly died. Okay, uh, so just to finish off what he says here. Um, the Putin regime is keenly aware of the delusions of the Biden administration National Security Advisor Sullivan and his Obama-era predecessor Susan Rice. These were the people Russia's reflexive control information warfare doctrine was created 25 odd years ago to map, capture the information channels to and fill with Russian delusion. Nor are they the only ones targeted. You see these sorts of Russian info war efforts all the time in the various Twitter spaces reporting on the Russo-Ukrainian war aimed at both the USA's left and right. The problem for the American people is that the delusions of some in DC elites cannot change the realities of Russia's ongoing internal meltdown. Russia will never be a useful ally for the great game with China or at best, it will be a big DPRK, so big um, North Korea. At worst, a large ex-Yugoslavia. All the de-escalation factions, they factor embargo on long-range strike capabilities like ATACMs and Western fourth generation jets. For the sake of their great game goals, did was increase AFU casualties, worldwide food supply chain and energy supply related economic disruptions. So he's really going for it here. I'd be interested if you agree or disagree with him. But partisan groupthink means people like Sullivan and Rice are fireproof. They could start a nuclear war and be forgiven since they are ideologically aligned with their partisan groupthinking powers that be. All of their follies are forgivable as they are in the party group thinking in group so that the media and partisan camp followers will forgive all such sins even if they act against their party interests and national interest that is the nature of partisan groupthink folly malice and self-interest driven behaviors are all forgiven it is that sort of u.s tribal based partisan groupthink delusions that are the most dangerous delusions in the russia ukrainian war nothing good will come of it in either party and both u.s major parties have groupthink delusions on russia one wants russia to be an ally for the great game with China, one sees Putin as a strong ally of Christianity against the godless international left. So he's saying that the Democrats see Russia as an ally for the great game with China, as an, an ally perhaps with themselves, so an ally with the US. To, so if we de-escalate and make friends with them, then they can be our friends against China. I'm not really sure that's realistically what what those he's talking about in a in the Democrat Party think, uh, Democratic Party. One sees Putin as a strong. Uh, so this is the Republicans see Putin as a strong ally of Christianity against the godless international left. Uh, I think that certainly is the case with the uh, with that fringe group uh, to the right of the GOP. Uh, but you know you know my biases and whatnot and in the meantime we get to see parades of russian atrocities that turn the russo ukrainian war into a grim u.s marines versus imperial japanese at okinawa slugfest with no quarter asked or taken there will be no negotiated peace treaty there will be a korean war style armistice at best you will know who is captured by russian reflexive control info war efforts going forward when they talk publicly about pressuring ukraine for a negotiated peace settlement 
of the Russo-Ukrainian war. So that's his rant. Uh, started off being about uh, cholera and disease and then veered very much into um, how the Biden administration is not strong enough on Ukraine. I don't know. There are people like Blinken who I think are doing a pretty good job in there. I think Biden's administration has done a marvelous job at unifying the rest of the world together. There is stuff, there's stuff going on behind the scenes that we have an awful lot to thank the U S for. If it wasn't for the U S Ukraine would be screwed. Right. So I, I don't think, I don't think you can look at it that simplistically. I think the US have done a, f a remarkable job. And while in certain situations they might not have been strong enough uh, in giving things early enough uh, and predicting that the, the, the really were no red lines and why aren't they still giving eight tackles and all that kind of stuff. So there are areas of improvement, but, but I really, you know, and this is not something I'd normally say of American military um you know the industrial military industrial complex and and America's foreign policy, but actually I think that they have done a pretty good job there. But I'd be interested to see what you think, uh, Americans and internationals alike. So that is broadly what I was going to say about the serious stuff. Uh, I've been speaking for way too long. Let's just quickly nip through some nice, enjoyable things to watch towards the end. Incredible. Ukrainians continue to innovate in the art of war because the entire nation's survival is at stake. Check this out. This is a pretty mad uh, video. Um, uh, I'm going to turn off the music, OBS. Uh, so this guy's on one of these, I don't know even what you call them. It's like a, a hoverboard, but with one wheel, and you stand each side of it. Uh, pretty mad. And he's a sniper. Gets off, down, shoot, shoot, shoot. Now, this is obviously not happening on the front line. This is somewhere, someone in way behind the front line doing a nice little TikTok video here. But I guess the idea is, could you see this being used on the front line? Is this a realistic application of, of, the, of that technology? Uh, here's obviously someone that, that can uh, fire a sniper rifle and drive one of those things. Is, is really that... Uh, a useful way of getting around. I don't know. It looks pretty cool to me. Uh, but I don't know whether he would say, yeah, actually, I will go and do that. I mean, him against a, a, a tree line of Russian people firing at him, I think he's going to get shot down fairly quickly. But that is pretty cool. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give that to him. You know, he's doing a good job and making that look easy as well. Um, so moving on, here we have some. So if. If you've not watched football and not watched Ronaldo, you won't necessarily get this as much, but this is pretty cool. Again, I have to turn off the music. It's got a timing there. Nice. That's Ronaldo's goal celebration. Uh, and the he, yeah, he likes a bit of uh, Ronaldo celebration. So we we'll just see that one more time. And there you go. So that's him uh, uh, enjoying himself while firing a massive death-inducing weapon. Uh, and the last thing I'm going to show you is in my new segment, which is crazy mad Ukrainian cyclists. So I showed you this video previously of a cyclist nonchalantly cycling through the blast cloud of a high uh, of a high mars and not even turning his head to look back or anything like that so crazy mad cyclist let's see another crazy mad cyclist here we see old man he's not he's not on a on a he's not on a bicycle dobre <laughs> den hello yeah just just uh just pushing my bike past uh, a big howitzer exploding in the tree line. I can't even see it. I'm not even going to turn and look at it. I'm just going to walk past. Thank you very much. And take my little bucket. And go get me some apples or something. Or fish bait. I don't know. Uh, there you go. That's the new segment. Crazy mad Ukrainian cyclists. Anyway, thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. Thank you for all the wonderful... Uh, contributors to the threads thank you to the members thanks to the people on the live stream last night who gifted memberships i need to look into exactly who did that it didn't flash up for me on on my interface so 
I couldn't thank them. That's why I didn't. Uh, but thank you. I know Lawrence was was one of them. You guys are such generous people. I really appreciate you, and so do the others. I'm sure in the in the threads. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you for your support. Take care. Speak to you soon.